So now that we've talked about the basics of completable futures, which as you can see are, are very basic, I'll show you an example of how we could use these very basic features in order to multiply big fractions. And this, this example is also here. So this is the big fraction example. And after I show you how to use basic features, you'll see why they're so limited. And we'll talk about why they're limited, which of course exists to motivate the need for the more advanced features, which are much, much cooler. So let's talk about the basic features. So the example here is something called big fraction. A big fraction is essentially an arbitrary precision fraction package where we have arbitrarily long numerator and denominator, and we can do all kinds of operations to multiply and divide and add and subtract and so on and so forth. So we can have gigantic big numbers, which are basically infinite precision. Why you would want infinite precision fractions is beyond me, but if you ever needed them, this is where you would go. Um, here are some of the other things you can do with this. You can create reduced fractions. So these are so-called improper fractions. And if you reduce them, you might have learned this when you were in you know, fourth or fifth grade. Um, this turns out to be four fifths. This is one half. This is two thirds and so on. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can create non-reduced fractions and then reduce them. So there's operations for reducing something that's non-reduced to begin with. So that's an example of how you would start out with something that was non-reduced and then reduce it through the reduce method. And you can also do arbitrary precision fraction arithmetic. So you can multiply big fractions together. Obviously, these are not big fractions, but they're little fractions. But I didn't want to make the big fraction take up the whole page. And something else you can do is you can create a mixed fraction from an improper fraction. So here's an imp so-called improper fraction, which I always thought was a funny name. Um, so it's like it didn't show up to dinner in a tux or something like that. It was improper. And so 18 fourths is really 4 and 1 half. So that's just the mixed version. And there's a bunch of methods for doing those kinds of things as well. OK. So here's the uh, actual piece of code that does this stuff. Or here's a piece of code that shows how some of this stuff works. And I have a little diagram over here to show the interactions. And then here's the code. And you can see this at the website. So we start out by making ourselves an empty future. So it has no, no value yet. We then go ahead and start a background thread. So the thread's running in the background. And this uses big integers in order to do the big fractions. So these are pretty big fractions. As you can imagine, we're going to multiply them together because that's a potentially long-running computation. We're going to run it in the background. That code will, of course, run concurrently to this code. I don't do much here, but I could do arbitrary things, and they would run in parallel. Um, and then when we're done, we explicitly complete the future. So we say, you know, multiply this result and store it into the future. So the future is now complete. And what that means is that the call to join here will now return instead of blocking, because its result is done. And we're converting it to a mixed string. So that's basically, yeah. Yes, it'll just, um, this join will, will block forever, and you'll never be done. That's a really good thing to remember, because with futures, much like with streams, if you don't sort of trigger them to wrap up, they will just block indefinitely. And that's a very easy bug to make. Like when you're programming with streams, you can sometimes forget to put the terminating operation at the end, and then the code never runs. You're like, what the heck? Why is it not running? With uh, these things, if you don't properly let the computation finish or, or join with it or get it or whatever you need to do, then it just won't, it won't create a result. It'll just run in the background. It may finish, actually, but you won't get the result. All right, so that's a very simple example. We'll look at some more interesting examples in a second. So there's a bunch of limitations with uh, the basic stuff. And in particular, the, the basic features of futures, completable futures, are really not that much different from the limitations with the basic features of futures. So we can't chain the results together fluently to handle asynchronous results as a, as a chain. I'll show you what that means in a second, if that doesn't make sense yet. You can't trigger these things reactively. You can't, for example, wait for multiple futures efficiently. You have to wait for them one at a time. And you can't treat a group of or collection of futures efficiently as a group. So those are things you can't do. There are limitations with this very simple interface. Um, and uh, just as a simple example, this is an example of this point about not being triggered reactively. So we're blocking here. We're explicitly blocking, waiting for the result. 
And that's almost always the wrong thing to do because we don't really know how long this is going to block. We don't know how long it should block. We could add in you know, a timed block, but it's still inefficient and error prone. So this is just an example of kind of what you don't want to do if you can avoid it. And naturally, the whole point of this is to motivate the advanced features, which we're about to talk about next. So that's, that's the real secret sauce here is we want to get to the advanced features because they're going to let us work around all these limitations we have with the basic features of futures.